So I'm uh, Michael Mazurik from Cornell University, and it's, it's an honor to be part of this conference. And I'm going to be telling you about uh, the my breeding role of my uh, program at Cornell in uh, two different projects. So one is the Novik project, which you've already uh, heard about, and the other is ASOCUKE, another uh, OREI funded project that's looking at the needs for summer squash, cucumbers, and melons on the eastern U.S. And in uh, thinking about the, the talk, one of the things I decided to share was a little bit uh, in our breeding strategy, uh, some of the things we're up to and some of the approaches we take uh, in our, our particular crops. So I tend to work on crops that uh, can be self-pollinated readily without uh, any issues. There's not really much uh, hybrid vigor, much heterosis uh, in, snap, in the peas, cucurbits, or peppers I work on. Uh, which is no, not to say they wouldn't benefit greatly from introducing some other uh, exotic genes from other sources. And so often uh, we've been finding in our breeding uh, program that uh, seeking out new diversity uh, to introduce into these backgrounds from uh, secondary centers of origin. Uh, one of the underlying themes you'll find is that we've been reaching out into some Southeast Asia uh, cultivars to be able to bring in some new genetics into what we've been working with and also crosses between species or subspecies to kind of bring more diversity into the crops we're working on, not just crossing within a market class, which is uh, often much more common. And so some of the big examples of what uh, can be done with this. So the first example, uh, striped cucumber beetle is definitely a big problem for a lot of organic growers. Uh, conventional growers have uh, really benefited from a lot of uh, really uh, effective pesticides. However, there's now some more uh, inquiry into kind of uh, if they might be having some effects on pollinators. Uh, and so even in conventional systems, uh, you know, that's uh, cucumber beetles are potentially going to be much more of a concern. Uh, and so here's an example on the top of a uh, summer squash. Uh, that is really non-preferred by beetles. And on the bottom, you can see in a golden zucchini, just the devastation uh, they wreak in both in terms of just devouring the plants and also uh, transmitting uh, bacterial wilt. And so the, one of the big differences between these two is that they represent two different subspecies uh, within summer squash. And so the ability to transfer the preference back and forth, uh, we think is going to be really powerful. Another uh, crop we work in, cu cucumber. So the East Coast, the Great Lakes region, downy mildew is a big problem. So you can recognize it by this uh, characteristic uh, rectangular lesions on the leaves, green, yellow, brown, mixed together. Uh, a disease that had been controlled for quite a while with genetic resistance. Um, the issues have been a new strain of the pathogen that have emerged that is overwintering uh, and moving up the coast in tropical storms from Florida and also moving across uh, uh, our region in New York. Uh, so as a result of some variety uh, trials, we found uh, quite a bit of variation. Two of the intermediate resistant varieties we found. Uh, Market More 97, uh, a Cornell release, and Ivory Queen, uh, both have had intermediate resistance. Uh, and combining those and some of the cucumbers together, and also with an eye toward things that do well in uh, kind of the Southeast Asia, uh, we've uh, come up with some more uh, really resistant breeding lines. Uh, on the top, there's uh, two of them. Uh, the top one, 12 to 64, has been released uh, just recently uh, by the name we have uh just stuck on for now the DMR 264. Uh, so that is, uh, people knew it as the breeding line that was on the trials. So we, we kept that uh, and are continuing to be able to move this resistance around into other backgrounds. But so you can see uh, it is still uh, trucking along, happy and green on the top. Uh, and some others uh, are really uh, absent uh, from the photograph. And so this is work that I've done uh, in collaboration with one of my students, Bill Holdsworth. Uh, one of the approaches uh, you can take to reduce downy mildew uh, is simply just to really uh, make it so there's little to no free moisture. So a really dry high tunnel is a great way to mitigate uh, downy mildew. One of the issues is you move into a high tunnel that's really dry uh, is that also you have a lot more transpiration and the very few cucumber beetles that do go inside transmit bacterial wilt and that a bacteria really clogs up the vasculature in this very high transpiration environment. 
And so, uh, again, you can see some pretty profound differences we can have in uh, cucumbers with bacterial wilt uh, resistance and those that don't. And I think you can see which is which uh, from that picture, the high tunnel from uh, Jason Grauer that's in our program. The, one of the squashes, one of our big successes, uh, you've heard uh, uh, Olori uh, gracious, graciously mention uh, honey nut. Uh, so this is a, a miniature butternut squash that uh, it was able to have a lot of great flavor uh, from some crosses with buttercup that were done by uh, Dick Robinson at Cornell uh, a couple decades ago. And so that's bringing in uh, some great flavor genetics from a different species from Maxima into Moshada. And as we've continued to try to work on this to improve the storability, do lots of crosses with uh, other squash that have different disease resistance, store longer, uh, we've been able to come up with many uh, new iterations of this that have been out on grower farms and trials, uh, looking at really how well it stores. So some of the major uh, complications that really impact the storability uh, would be gummy stem blight here in the top left uh, that later on can uh, continue to persist and become a pretty bad soil-borne disease, the cause of black rot. So the fruit rotting in the bottom right uh, is the same pathogen, just causing different uh, disease symptoms. Uh, cucumber beetles are a big pest, not only in uh, tearing apart the plant, but also as they feed on the fruit, uh, that leads to some storability problems as well. In addition, powdery and downy mildew as we go through the field and make selections, like you can see on the bottom left, uh, the plants that still have leaves are still, still continuing to put sugars into the fruit, so we get a much uh, better, uh, sweeter fruit that way. So that's a whole uh, array of uh, attributes we select for in the field. And one of the most surprising and interesting things we found is, again, we ended up reaching to a lot of Southeast Asia uh, germplasm for a lot of what was noted large, uh, largely anecdotally as terms of different attributes that could bring in terms of some disease resistance. And we found some great downy mildew resistance in that material and it brought it into that uh, powdery mildew that complements the major powdery mildew resistance genetics uh, in Moshada very well. Um, but also as we brought in some of this germ plasma that's been selected for different properties and much higher dry matter uh, than we're used to in a lot of uh, butternut, certainly, and then a lot of kind of the American taste for a sweeter squash, is we found that we can have a dramatic ability to really increase quality in general, uh, especially uh, in storage. And so this is a graph uh, through a lot of work done by another one of my graduate students, Lindsay Wyatt, and uh, a technician, Marianne Fink, where on the y-axis, they have the degrees bricks. So the higher the bricks, the sweeter it is. Uh, and so often, uh, a lot of the butternuts you'll encounter are maybe in the, the 10 to 12 category. Some of the ones that are picked a little immature, maybe, so they'll store better, are a little lower. Uh, and so we are now very proud in some of our selections to be dangerously close to be breaking 20, which is almost tooth achingly sweet, which is really exciting. Um, along the, uh, the x-axis is the percent dry matter. And so the amount of dry matter is really important to having a good texture, mouthfeel, uh, and some of the squash that, uh, you know, are a little bit wetter, moister, um, have kind of a less of a, a good uh, creamy texture would be much lower in dry matter. And so as we reach out into these Southeast Asian varieties that had a really high dry matter content, we can really boost dry matter. And another part where dry matter really comes in, it's important. Uh, Brent Loy has written a lot about this, uh, is as during storage. So the dry matter is largely the starches. And during storage and curing, these break down into the simple sugars that causes sweetness. And so by really pushing the ability of these fruit to accumulate these carbohydrate reserves, uh, we are increasing their ability both to have a really good dry matter and also be able to sacrifice a lot of that starch into the sweetness and the sugars. So we are looking for squash to score well up in the, the top right corner of that to try to get the best of both. And along... Uh, in this process, we've had a, a lot of generous support. Uh, two uh, USDA OREI projects, the Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative, NOVIC, uh, ASOQ. Uh, the ASOQ website has also a great group of team members I'm lucky to be part of. You can uh, also see uh, kind of a description of what we're up to on our eOrganic website. 
and a couple AFRI projects to support some of the other uh, hypothesis-based inquiry and graduate student support as we do these uh, projects uh, towards sustainability foundation, organic farming research foundation are critical, especially in getting some of the initial work done and uh, our capacity to produce good stock seed of these. And also we're excited to be able to add a, a Seed Matters postdoctoral fellowship now to this list. Thank you.